While my love for Sega is easily traced back to its arcade roots in the mid-1980s, what I was playing at home at that time was something entirely different. In the arcade, there was Hang On, Space Harrier, Outrun, and Enduro Racer, graphical powerhouses that blew my mind. Yet at home, I had an Atari VCS, also known as a 2600, a machine I had grown to despise towards the end of its life thanks to its deluge of awful titles. But in 1985, a new console contender emerged. The Nintendo Entertainment System was a revelation the first time I played it. The games looked so cool, a massive step up from the stuff I had played at home before. It would take me a while, but I got my own NES during the Christmas of 1986. That began a journey of great games from a ton of different developers and publishers. They created games that made an arcade snob like me respect console gaming for the very first time. Among those great games was Nintendo's own Super Mario Bros. They had multiple adventures on the NES, and those games just kept getting better and better with each new entry. Nintendo also expanded the Mario franchise each time a new console generation launched back then. The games got bigger with more to discover, and there were always a whole host of new powers Mario could take advantage of. Whether it was Super Mario World on the Super Nintendo, or Super Mario 64 on the Nintendo 64, the mustachioed plumber made a big impact each and every time he showed up. And in this episode, we are going to take a look at the first 11 years of the series through the eyes of a diehard Sega fan. Were these games as good as all that? And where do they fall in the pecking order of best to worst? This is a massive episode and we are covering some of the most beloved games ever released to the gaming public. So sit back, relax, and get ready for Super Mario Bros. A Super Journey, 1985 to 1996. Before we jump into the mainline Super Mario titles, let's first take a quick look at the origins of the character and franchise. The first time I saw Mario, or at least the first time I saw someone that looked like him, was in 1981's Donkey Kong. The brainchild of Shigeru Miyamoto and Gunpei Yokoi, Mario wasn't a plumber back then, but instead a carpenter, trying to rescue a damsel in distress from a mighty gorilla. That game was a massive success for Nintendo and was ported to just about every device on the retail market. Mario would reprise his role the following year with Donkey Kong Jr., this time as the antagonist in a classic case of role reversal. Mario is captured and caged Donkey Kong and actively tries to stop Jr. from rescuing him. It was an interesting introduction to Mario as both a hero and villain. Again, Nintendo had great critical and commercial acclaim for this release, further establishing them as an arcade manufacturer to be noticed. Of course, the success of these games spurred Nintendo to continue pumping out titles, and the next in line fell in 1983, Mario Brothers. This was in a lot of ways a transformational release for the Mario character, and ultimately, the universe he would be spun off into. No longer a carpenter, Mario is now a plumber with a brother named Luigi. It was set in the sewers of New York City as the two brothers attempt to clean it up, battling a mix of enemies like turtles, crabs, flies, and even fireballs. This really set the stage for what was to come. It was clear that Mario was ready to take flight in his own universe. No more spin-offs connected to Donkey Kong. It was time to go super. Nineteen eighty-five was a huge year for Mario for a number of reasons. It was the year the NES was released in the United States, and it was the year he appeared in Super Mario Brothers. There's a lot to unpack here because contrary to what some people believe, Super Mario Brothers was not a pack-in in the original launch hardware. Hell, there is some argument as to the exact launch date of Super Mario Brothers in the US. 
What I can tell you as someone who lived through that time, this title was intrinsically tied to the early rise of the NES, and ultimately, that system's complete domination of the US home market. So much so, I can tell you the entire story of the very first time I played this, because it is still so prominent in my mind nearly 40 years after the fact. I even played it quite a bit when the arcade version was released, a Nintendo vs. System classic in its own right. To appreciate the impact of this title, you really need to look at the other games released at the time. Super Mario Bros. wasn't the first platformer ever made, but it was certainly one of the most interactive, and gave you so much more to do than you typically saw in the simplistic titles of the era. Mario could destroy the very building blocks of the stages themselves, often hiding power-ups, extra lives, and additional coins. There was also an unusual amount of interaction with the enemies themselves. Mario could simply use fireballs to dispatch the bad guys, but you could also jump on a number of them and then use their bodies to knock out the others. There were also underwater areas, hidden warp zones to skip deeper into the game, and some areas even had maze-like puzzle elements to contend with. There really wasn't anything else like it, and those early days were filled with finding secrets, speed runs, and playing with your friends. It was a really nice looking and sounding game as well. Even with the limits of the NES, it was colorful, the sprites looked great, and the soundtrack was absolutely unforgettable. In 1985, Super Mario Bros. was a standout that would become the face of just how good NES games could be. Nintendo eventually packed it in with the unit, helping them the millions of sales and complete domination of the US console market. For those that think it's too easy, be sure to try out the previously mentioned arcade version. The changes made in Versus Super Mario Bros. is no joke. A year later, in 1986, Nintendo released Super Mario Bros. 2 on the Japanese Famicom Disk System. This one was something I never knew existed until years later when it showed up in the compilation Super Mario All-Stars for the Super Nintendo. As many of you know, this was not the Super Mario Bros. 2 we received in the US. This was more an expansion to the original with new gameplay rules, like poison mushrooms that can kill you, reverse warp zones that can actually regress your current stage, and Luigi actually having his own traits that made him feel completely different from Mario. Visually, it was very similar with just a few new art assets here and there, but at first glance, it would be easy to mistake it for the original. My initial impression of this was quite negative. It was unfairly difficult and unlike the first, actually punished you for looking for secrets. Having to replay stages after finding a negative warp zone was nonsense, especially since some of these areas were really tough the first time through. With a bit of time and additional play, I did come to appreciate the design more, but the difficulty is always vicious and the biggest roadblock to enjoying this. This is primarily the reason Nintendo did not bring it west initially, and ended up taking a completely different route with the series. I can't say I'm unhappy with that choice, because the Super Mario Bros. 2 we did get is one of my favorite games on the platform. It was actually 1988 when the US received its own Super Mario Bros. 2. Again, completely unbeknownst to me at the time, this was actually based on a previous game released in Japan as Yume Kojo, Doki Doki Panic. It was a Japanese Famicom Disk System title released in 1987. Nintendo would heavily modify this title and add Super Mario Bros. characters to the mix, creating what was at the time a pretty radical feeling departure from the first title. Instead of just Mario and Luigi, you also got Princess Peach and Toad to choose from. 
But these weren't simple palette swaps as before. Each of these four choices played with their own distinct abilities. Mario was fast, Luigi could jump high, the princess could float, and finally Toad was really strong. Aside from these attributes, the core gameplay was also a pretty big change. Mario and Pals couldn't just jump on some of the enemies here, and instead needed to throw items at them. These ranged from vegetables to blocks to the enemies themselves. Another big part of the change was the addition of massive vertically scrolling stages. You weren't just running left to right, but also climbing and falling. Power-ups still came in the form of mushrooms and stars, but the way they appear changed up quite a bit. One thing I really enjoyed were the boss fights. Locked in a small room, you had to face down bad guys that were throwing things at you while you had a small supply of blocks to throw back. The entire thing was a dream for me and one of the very best NES experiences I had up until that point. The bottom line was this. Aside from being a platformer and sharing similar traits to that genre, this felt nothing like the first Super Mario Brothers. And I absolutely adored it for that. Among the many things I did not know during those days, the Japanese version of Super Mario Bros. 3 released only a few weeks after the US got Super Mario Bros. 2. That means that when the third installment finally launched for me to play in February of 1990, it was well over a year later. To put that into perspective, I had a Sega Genesis when this game first saw the light of day in the US. But the lead up had been huge and the hype was undeniable. I can't lie. Even with a brand new 16-bit console, I still wanted to play Super Mario Bros. 3 really bad. And it was really easy to do that because just about every person I knew that owned an NES eventually scored a copy of Super Mario 3. Kids were talking about it at school. Magazines, movies, TV commercials, it was absolutely everywhere. Nintendo was wise to get it out there in as many markets as possible, because the quality of this title was nothing short of genre-defining. Nintendo R&D 4 built what was, at the time, one of the deepest and well-designed platformers I had ever seen. Things started off with you navigating a map with multiple paths and selectable stages. As you defeated these stages, new paths would open up, giving you access to a world at large. Once you reached the end of an area, you'd face a boss and close things out and move on. The gameplay was familiar enough in its basics. As Mario, you'd run and jump your way through stages, hunting for coins, mushrooms, fire flowers, and stars. Also added to the mix were suits that bestowed additional abilities to our hero. There was a raccoon and tanuki suit that gave Mario limited flight. There was a frog suit that helped him swim more effectively. The hammer suit allowed you to chuck hammers at your foes and protect yourself from fire but it was the stage design that I personally enjoyed the most. Each world was based on a different biome or theme. The opening world was a simple grassland, but then there was a desert to traverse, a world full of water, a world of giant enemies, an ice world, and so on that lent the game a variety to really help it define its identity. The previously mentioned power-ups Mario could use were also tailor-made for many of these environments. I can remember quite well that despite the Sega Genesis and NEC TurboGrafx-16 also being available in 1990, it was Super Mario Bros. 3 that was winning the hearts and minds among the children in my school. There are those that will tell you that it was Sonic the Hedgehog that turned around the fortunes of the Genesis in the US in 1991. I'd argue that the Genesis was already on an unstoppable ascent to success. It was just Super Mario Bros. 3 delayed it a year due to its iron grip on the market. It would go on to sell nearly 20 million units during its run, making Nintendo hundreds of millions of dollars. Even in my tiny podunk mountain town, its influence and popularity was unrivaled.
Talking about Super Mario Brothers wouldn't be complete without mentioning his adventures on the Nintendo Game Boy. In 1989, Super Mario Land launched with the hardware and was the first time the series would be developed without Shigeru Miyamoto. This meant that it would go on to look and play quite different from the Mario titles before it. It was still a run and jump platformer, but here you got a new setting, a new princess to rescue, and bouncing super balls instead of fireballs. There were also new enemies to face, and even the familiar ones like the turtles had new attacks you must avoid. The physics of how Mario moved and jumped also underwent some pretty big changes, and you'll feel it from the moment you start moving around. I played it so much I could run through at full speed and defeat it at will, rarely losing a life. My greatest memory of this is that it felt like a full console experience on the go, something I had never had at that point. There are many that will see this one in a negative light because of its new direction, but like the US version of Super Mario Bros. 2, it was its differences that drew me in and made me appreciate it even more. The Super Mario series had not been the same game over and over again, and in this industry, that's something worth celebrating. Miyamoto was back in the saddle for Super Mario World in 1991, a pack-in with the brand new Super Nintendo Entertainment System. This one was a natural extension of the third game, now with new power-ups, a larger continuous world map, and more secrets than all the other previous games combined. It showed up shortly after Sonic in North America, so its immediate impact was not as large as it could have been, especially with the Sega Maid game having visuals that put it to shame. But what Super Mario World lacked in visual pizzazz, it more than made up for in content, design, and special effects. For a tiny 4 megabit cartridge, Nintendo stuffed a surprising amount of stuff to see and do in this game, and its legacy reflects that. It also introduced Yoshi to the series. You also get the feather, which in turn gives you a cape that can be used for flight, an important part of finding secrets that can lead to additional stages. And really, the secrets are what make this game so well done. They are everywhere. You'll need to check every section of the screen for something you may have missed, because there is always a chance it could lead to somewhere new. The world map is also incredibly well done, connecting each and every area together nicely. I really dug the special effects in this game as well. While I found the main presentation to be quite tame and repetitive, the extra abilities of the Super Nintendo hardware come through and save the day. There was background scaling effects everywhere, gorgeous transparencies, and even a final boss that really took advantage of the hardware capabilities. They were nice touches to an expertly designed adventure. When Super Mario Land 2 Six Golden Coins landed in late 1992, I was trying to support a Sega Genesis, a TurboGrafx-16, a Sega CD, a Super Nintendo, a Game Gear, and a pregnant girlfriend, so you can imagine that some things had to be left behind. I didn't play this one much at the time, so it doesn't hold quite the same nostalgic punch as many of the other Super Mario titles. When I finally did sit down and give it its due, I came to enjoy it quite a bit. This is another one where Miyamoto had no involvement, so again, it feels quite different from the mainline series. It also employs some changes over the first Super Mario Land, especially in its much larger characters and zoomed-in perspective. It features many of the elements that made Mario 3 and Mario World so well-liked. There is an overworld map that governs the area, there's power-ups like Bunny Years that gives Mario the ability to fly, as well as your typical items like Fire Flowers, Mushrooms, and Invincibility Stars. 
Mario's evil counterpart Wario was also introduced in this game, a character that would go on to star in a fair few titles of his own, including a direct Game Boy sequel to this one. It was late 1995 when Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island showed up on the Super Nintendo, a Super FX2 powered swan song for the series on Nintendo's fourth generation console. I owned both a Saturn and PlayStation when this showed up and I still scored it, I wanted to play it so bad. And what an adventure it was. Mario was back riding Yoshi, but pretty much everything changed from there. With Yoshi in control, flinging dinosaur eggs became one of your main weapons, as well as a way to find secrets and interact with the environment. The main objective was to get through the level while protecting baby Mario, but there was also lots of things to collect. Thanks to the power of the Super FX2 chip, you get tons of great sprite effects here, and the art style really pairs well with Yoshi's world and the characters within. The Saturn and PlayStation may have been the powerful new kids on the block, but this game looked like it belonged on a 32-bit console. It was games like this why the Super Nintendo lasted well into the 32-bit generation as a viable platform, and allowed Nintendo to stay competitive despite the two-year head start of its competitors. Our final game of this episode is 1996's Super Mario 64, the very first time we saw Nintendo's mascot in his very own 3D adventure. When this was released first in Japan, I had a friend that picked it up at launch and allowed me to play it. I confess I had little interest in the Nintendo 64 at that point, but this game turned that around instantly. Nintendo transitioned Mario into 3D polygons seamlessly, almost as if he was made for it. Where Sega had failed miserably getting Sonic to do the same, Super Mario 64's slower gameplay and more measured design flourished. Right from the get-go, Miyamoto and his team built the game around a central hub castle, full of rooms and paintings that needed to be unlocked with stars that you collected in each world. This hub had the same gameplay as the main stages and itself was full of secrets to discover. You faced many familiar enemies throughout, though there were a number of changes to the basic design. Mario would have a life gauge for the first time instead of relying on simple power-ups like mushrooms for the ability to take damage. Coins acted as not just a way to get extra lives, but also healed Mario's hit points. There are different hats Mario can find to give him various abilities. The wing cap allows you to fly, the metal cap makes you impervious to many types of damage, and the vanish cap allows you to walk through certain surfaces. The stage design was nothing short of brilliant. Nintendo would make simple obstacle courses and hide stars in them. That's it. That's the entire premise. But these play areas allowed you to freely explore, run around and play with all the things within, and bask in Mario's expert acrobatic abilities. Seriously, the analog control over Mario was astonishing. From tiptoeing to reverse flips to triple jumps, this game quickly become the face of what analog control could do for a 3D platformer and games in general. To date, it's one of my favorite 3D platformers of all time. I wanted to do this episode for a few different reasons. One, I am a fan of the early Mario titles and wanted to share my experiences and opinions about them. 
I chose these games because this is when Mario meant the most to me, when a new release in that series meant as much as a new Castlevania or Shinobi. But I also wanted to share with you that even though I am a dedicated Sega fan, I enjoyed a number of Nintendo franchises just as much. I had the fortune of being a bit older when the console market heated up in the 16-bit era, so I was able to buy and rent games with my own money. It also allowed me to take part in playing games for multiple platforms, resulting in the best possible experience. The dark days of being locked to a single platform and relying on my parents for games only lasted during the 8-bit era for me, a time when Nintendo dominated everything in my neck of the woods anyway. As for old Mario here, he'd go on to star in many more adventures and spin-offs in the years to come. Many of these games are likely as special to some of you as these were to me, and we will certainly be taking a look at those in the future. There really is no question that Mario and Pals have played a huge role in Nintendo's longevity in the console market. Along with Zelda and a few other franchises, they have kept the big end relevant with old and new gamers alike. This is perhaps their greatest legacy, designing their software to be as fun and accessible to as many players as possible typically resulted in something special. I'm Sigalord X, thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.